can't eat meat and claims to be an environmentalist. Sounds pretty extreme, doesn't it? There's no escaping the fact that agriculture is the largest human polluter, and it accounts for a larger amount of greenhouse gas emissions than any other industry. It can even account for 40% of the total share. It seems important first to explain why the situation isn't as positive as we'd like. And this is because the, si the, uh, the system in place in most parts of the world at the minute is a system of intensive agriculture. This knock-on of industrialization is essentially trying to squeeze the largest amount of yield from the smallest amount of land by virtually any means. Some of the methods used are heavy use of pesticides and antibiotics, heavy use of chemical fertilizer, and unnecessary deep tilling, which exposes the soil to the elements, making it susceptible to erosion. It's even more shocking when we realize that 40% of the Earth's ice-free land surface is used for agricultural purposes. And much of it, most of it, is managed in this way. There's no escaping the fact that any participation in the meat industry is counterintuitive to the aims of environmentalism and environmental protection. But I'm not saying it's a lost cause. I'd like to talk with you today about how we can make our participation in the meat industry as consumers a more mindful one. And I'd like to take the opportunity to say I'm not a farmer, uh, and I'm not in the agriculture business, and I'm not particularly interested in percentage yield. What I am interested in is food, meat, and now I can buy the best of what's available in the most environmentally friendly way possible. So in search of ideas for this talk, um, I don't know if any of you know, but I reached out to a group of people who had more knowledge on this topic than you or I. I'm referring to the Blue Hill at Stone Barns restaurant in New York. And this, uh, the Blue Hill group, along with their executive chef, Dan Barber, have been outspoken advocates of the farm to table movement in the US and do it in the most customer friendly way by serving challenging but incredibly delicious food. So I arranged a call with their vice president, Irene Hamburger, um, and she was incredibly helpful in giving me some ideas. So the idea I took away, mostly, was an extremely simple one, but to me was incredibly new. So in recent years, the idea of our carbon footprint has become a stark reality. We can calculate the amount of excess carbon we produce in our lives and as a result of every action we take. And food miles is an extension of this. The distance our food has to travel, not just across the country, but internationally as well, is frankly appalling. And in the UK especially, eating seasonally is a good way to promote a reduction of food miles. Eating fruit and vegetables from the UK in their season, and when nature dictates them to be at their best, is an increasingly valued concept. The idea I took away was that we can apply this concept to our meat as well. It seems like a strange concept to apply to meat, in contrast to applying to vegetables. But it makes a lot more sense when you realize that you're not just eating that animal, you are also eating what that animal has eaten. To me, it seems like the idea of constant availability is even more you know, present in terms of meat. We all have this idea as a culture that we can go to the supermarket and pork beef, lamb, and chicken available to us every day of every week of every month. But on reflection, surely this seems a little unnatural. But if we think of it as we're not just eating a part of that animal, we're eating what that animal is eating too. Cows and deer that have been fattened on late summer's sweetest, most nutrient-rich grass will surely be at their best in autumn. Pigs that are fed on autumn's nuts and apples will surely be at their best in winter. Chicken is a meat that's eaten more than any other in the UK. It's a natural, naturally foraging animal and feeds on the April showers, insects, worms, essentially anything you find that come from the April showers. So why is it that we would choose to eat chicken at the dead of winter when it's been cooped up, fed on concentrated cereal pellets, when there's no grass or insects or worms to speak of? It doesn't make any sense taste-wise and doesn't make any sense energy-wise. Now I've said, these animals, you're not just eating a part of the animal, being a part of what the animals eat as well. And when you imagine a farmyard scene, I bet you're thinking of rolling green pastures, pure grass, right? But as a result of intensive agriculture, this has become an idea we have because there's, there's a distinct separation of livestock and crop or arable farming. And this is a, a result of industrialization and trying to squeeze out the biggest amount of yield possible from the smallest area of land. But some of the methods that are used currently have been seen as having devastating impacts on the environment and the earth. 
And in fact, the earth has lost a third of total arable land in the last 40 years alone. Now, the separation of livestock and arable farming seems like an economist solution to a biological problem. But this is a problem quickly going out of hand as a result of deep tilling, heavy use of chemical fertilizers, and a loss of biodiversity. So why not look for the biologist's solution? The benefits of integrating crop, uh, arable and livestock farming can be seen when you have a close proximity of livestock to crops, there is easily gathering treatment of manure for fertilizer. Livestock that are allowed to ruminate around these crops will help tread in this fertilizer, and chickens falling in their wake will help break it up as it for food. It's even been shown that pigs, in their natural instinct to look for food, will perform a sort of natural tilling, churning the earth, putting organic material back into the soil to help with the nutrient cycle. But again, let me stop for you. Why do we care about diversified farming? Because it all translates to flavor. It's a seemingly obvious truth, but all of these animals, in the form they took before intensive agriculture, didn't rely on concentrated cereal pellets for food. I believe they all would, if they could, choose to gain for themselves a much more diverse, interesting, and complex diet of anything the season could offer them. What was best at that time of year? To my mind, it seems like feeding an animal concentrated cereal pellets that are standardized will produce standardized, frankly, boring meat. An animal that's been allowed to find for itself, albeit with the aid of a farmer, a more interesting and diverse range of foods will result in more interesting, complex, and varied meat. Frankly, more delicious. Now, I feel like whenever someone talks about environmental protection, they will think, here we go again, more self-sacrifice. This is not going to end well for anybody. But I think what we've got here is a chance to look at the situation that frankly isn't as positive as we'd like and see that what we have is an opportunity for us to not only improve the countryside, improve the environment, and look at the products our local community can provide, but also improve our plates, which is what this is all in aid of. So I've talked a bit, and um, what can we take away from all this? What do I want you to go away thinking about? Well, firstly, the whole purpose of this is to reduce the amount of energy required to put the food on our plates. It's about thinking of the animal as a living product the steak you buy as having a history. How has it moved in its, in its environment? Are the conditions right to make the best of what this product can be? Or frankly, as delicious as it could be. And secondly, while it's a wider issue, I want us all to go away and go take the time to go to our local butcher and ask the questions of the people producing these products. Because that's the only way that you can ensure that the meat you're buying is as varied, as complex, as interesting, and frankly delicious as it possibly can be. Now, your actions might not change the world, but they'll change your world. And any major change comes with taking the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. Thank you very much.